How's it going, everybody? We're just gonna give everybody another minute or two here, just in case some people are a little bit late, but we're gonna get going in just one moment. If anybody is unable to hear me as well, please throw a question in there, just letting me know if it's not clear at all. And are people currently able to see my screen right now? Excellent. All right, let's get underway. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your days to come to the second part of our Unistream series and the Locked In Learning series. Today, we're gonna to be going over the HMI, the ladder, and the memory. These are the three main ways that you are going to build your program out, the three main components of your program that are all going to play with each other uh, to create the project that you desire. So just a quick recap on where we are at in this series. This is the second part of our four-part series on Unilogic. Tuesdays, we go over Unilogic topics, and today we will be covering the ladder, the HMI, and the memory of Unilogic. On Thursday, we will be covering the same topic in Visilogic. And next Tuesday, we will be moving on to data logging. And then finally, the week after, communications. So let's quick briefly talk about these three components. The latter is really the heart of the program. Um, this is what is going to drive all of the decision making in your program. It's how you're going to automate your processes. So super simplifying the idea of ladder, um, you're basically making if this, then that statements. Um, you're making a series of statements which verify the true or false nature of something, whether a sensor is on, whether a number is at a certain set point, something like that. And then on the outside of that, on the right-hand side of that, you have the effect of that, the then this. So power flows from the left to the right, and if the statements, the contacts leading in are true, then power is going to flow to the next element. And at the end of that series of statements, you put what you want to happen if those things are true. Now, the, we are going to be covering a lot in a very short time period today. So I'm going to go from the very basics of ladder all the way to making a UDFB, which is a user-defined function block. This is basically making your own function blocks in the ladder if there isn't already one in the toolbox that meets your need. Um, that way you can repurpose it and use it again and again as many times as you need. Our example will be pretty simple for it, but the idea can be um, you know, extrapolated out to much more complex topics. The HMI is the human machine interface. Uh, oftentimes it is also referred to as the graphic user interface or the GUI. Uh, this is what the user is going to be interacting with to uh, control that ladder. Um, so the ladder and the process that you build, the tunnel into that, the way for the operator to interact with that is going to be through that HMI. Uh, and this is going to be built on both controllers that have a physical screen, as well as even the PLCs without a physical screen. You're still gonna build this HMI, this graphic user interface, uh, and they'll be able to use it on their phone or on their smartphone using a VNC connection. 
And then last but certainly not least, we have memory. So memory is what links everything in the program together. Um, a number that's entered on the screen is going to be in memory and you can reference that memory in your ladder. So memory is really the glue that holds everything together uh, and really makes it an all-in-one experience. You have one memory base that you're gonna do everything with. Um, there's no you know, making memory for the screen, making memory for the ladder and trying to get everything to play nice. Uh, you make one piece of memory and it's gonna be accessible wherever you need to use it. The memory with Unilogic is dynamic, meaning that you have a set amount of memory from the get-go and it's up to you how you use it. So unlike, this is different than Vision in that Vision gave you a set number of memory. Uh, they would give you a certain number of memory bits, a certain number of memory integers, numbers, things like that. So it was pre-allocated for you. Uh, with Unilogic, it's up to you how you use it. If you wanted to have almost no ladder and put all your memory toward data tables or something like that, you have that option. It's much more flexible. And with memory, the we have something really powerful called structs. So if you're familiar with arrays, let's say we had an integer, which is a number value. An array is simply a bunch of those numbers in a row. So if I wanted 10 numbers, I could make an integer type and make it of an array length 10. And now I have 10 of those numbers, but they're all the same data type. A structure actually allows you to define different data types um, so you could have some bits, some numbers, some strings even, whatever you need in your, in your structure. And then you can make as many instances of that structure to get that whole set of tags all at once. It's kind of like making a blueprint uh, for the design of something. And then anytime you need to make an instance of that, you just reference the blueprint and then you have a whole new set of that. So with that, we're gonna dive into the software itself. So here I have a 15 inch Unilogic project opened. It is brand new. I have not created anything in it just yet. And you can see here that we default to the screen. So this is our HMI. And the HMI is going to be built out using this toolbox section. If you remember from the first part in this series, the five main components of Unilogic is the solution explorer, the ribbon across the top, the toolbox, the properties, and the memory down at the bottom. So you can see over here in the toolbox, we can design our screen using a whole number of different things, buttons, text, images, whatever we wanna put on screen to build out. And this is through this screen section here. So in the solution explorer, we're under HMI, module one, and then screen one. Now I can add another screen very easily just by right clicking in the module. So it's very easy to add additional screens as you need while you're designing. Um, again, this goes back to the dynamic memory. If you wanna have a whole lot of screens with not a lot of things on them, you could have that. Uh, it's all how you wanna segment the memory out. Now you can see that one of these screens is in bold. See how screen one is bold? That is because this is the main screen and this is what is going to show up when we power up the controller. This is gonna be the first screen. You can change this by right clicking on another screen and setting that as the main screen. In this case, we'll just leave screen one as our main screen. And now let's take a quick look at our ladder. So if we go to our ladder or module one and our function one, similarly to the screen, there is going to be a bolded function. Currently we only have one function, but this is in bold right now, is in bold. And it is going to be the only function that runs out of the gate. When you download this to the controller, this is the only function that is going to be running. And if you would like to run another function that you have created, you can simply call that function either by dragging and dropping it, or you could use a call, 
call function here if you would like to find it in the toolbox. This toolbox search functionality is extremely powerful. Uh, let's say, for example, you were trying to do a quick comparison with numbers and you wanted to know if something was greater than, you can just start to type that out and it's going to automatically filter the blocks down to only what's relevant to your search. Now let's talk about the fundamentals of ladder real quick. The left bar here that is just on the right hand side of these numbers, this is the power rail. So imagine that power is flowing through this line. And what we are going to be doing is we're going to be putting if statements, which are base, which are these contacts over here. So let's say we put a direct contact down. A direct contact is saying if this is true. An inverted contact saying if this is not true. So if this was a zero, this is going to pass power. If this was a one, this is going to pass power. And you remember a moment ago, I mentioned that memory is what's going to bring everything together on the controller. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a third contact here. So again, this is if this statement is true, it's going to pass power. This one says if it is a zero, it's going to pass power. And then we also have positive and negative transition contacts. This is when a bit goes from a zero to a one. That is a positive transition. And it is going to pass power just a single time. These elements will continually pass power. So if this is a one or if it is true, it is going to keep passing power to the right. Likewise, if this is a zero, this is going to keep passing power to the right. However, the positive and negatives will only deliver a single shot of power to the elements to the right. So these are great for things that you want to happen a single time. For example, you can think of toggling a light. When you flip a light switch, just when it goes on or when it goes off, do you want to change the state of the light? So let's actually do that right now. And let's build the ladder for a simple toggle light. I'm going to delete these other contacts. I'm going to leave a positive transition contact in here. And now I'm going to create the first bit of memory. So, so far, we haven't created any memory. And you can see that this positive transition contact is looking for a tag here. So if I create a tag using this pencil, and I'm going to call this tag toggle light. And this, I'm going to end up linking to a button on the screen. That way, when I push this button, we are going to toggle the state of a light. If we'd like, we could give this a power up value, such as a zero or a one. In this case, it's going to be controlled through that button on screen, so there's no need. Here, you can see an array length if I wanted to create more than just one bit. For example, maybe I was making 10 lights all at once. I could type in 10, and I would get 10 separate bits toggle light zero through toggle light nine. In this case, we're fine. So we have our toggle light. So when we push that button, this is going to deliver power just for a single shot to the next element. And so far, we have talked about contacts. Contacts are these vertical line elements. You can see they're straight up and straight down. These are your if statements. Now, the then statements are these rounded brackets, and they are coils. So similar to a direct contact, a direct coil will continue to turn that bit on while it receives power. An inverted coil will continue to turn a bit off while it's receiving power. A set coil is once it receives power a single time, it will just be set on. A reset coil, it receives power a single time and it will be set off. 
and we get to the, co the coil that we're interested in, the toggle coil. We can either drag and drop that in, or we could even just double click on it and it will go to the next element. And this is the bit that we are toggling. So every time we push that button on screen, we are going to toggle this bit. So I will create a new bit and I'm going to call this light state. And we can save that. So every time I push my toggle light button, I am going to be toggling my light state. Now it's important that I use a positive transition contact here because the button that I'm gonna create on screen, while they hold the button on screen, this bit is going to stay on. It's gonna stay as a one until they release that button. So if this were a direct contact, this would be happening hundreds, if not thousands of times during the time that they're holding their finger on screen. So right now, this is just a single net of ladder. It's very easy to see what's going on with this. Now to understand the flow of ladder, uh, it's very similar to reading a book. We are going left to right, top to bottom. So that power flow is gonna go down the rail. It's gonna check if you're pushing the light. If you are, it's gonna pass power to this and it is going to toggle the light state. After it completes there, it is gonna come down to net two. And if we had additional logic running in net two, it would then process through that and then net three and four and five. And this is happening hundreds, if not thousands of times per second. The scan time, the time in which it takes it to go through the entire program and check everything uh, is dependent on the size and the types of functions that you're using. But this is happening extremely, extremely fast. So I'm actually going to go to my screen two now remember, this is not the screen that's powering up, but we'll get back to that in just one moment. And I'm going to build this light control right here. So I mentioned that I was going to have a button to trigger this. So I can either double click the button or drag and drop the button onto my screen. Make it a little bit larger. And you can see down here in the properties, the properties are now related to this button. If I select away from the button, it goes back to the display. In this case, I want to set up the properties of the button. First thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give this a label. So instead of button one, I'm going to say toggle light. And I'm going to give this button an action. So actions are how the HMI affects, or how buttons affect uh, the ladder and the memory. So this is what's going to happen when we press the button. So I'll browse the actions, and you can see that I can add a new action. And again, what I wanna create here is what's referred to as a momentary button. So when they press and are holding this button, I want that light to be on, or I want the bit to be on. And when they release the light, I want it to go off. To do this, we're gonna add two actions. The first action is gonna be a set bit. And we're gonna set a bit when they press the button. And the bit that they are going to set is the toggle light. So every time they push this, we want to toggle the light. And we want to reset that same toggle light bit when we release. Now, quick explanation, the click slash tap, uh, if you've ever in other softwares used something where you click, like right now I'm clicking on release, uh, but you move off of the selection and let go, it doesn't take the selection. And that is what that is what the click slash tap does. It allows the user to press the button, decide that they did not want to do it and take it off. In this case, we don't need it. So we're just going to say that we set this bit when we press it and we reset that same bit when we release it. So that bit is only gonna be on while we're holding it. And to go full circle, if we go back to our function, when they press it, this is gonna send a single shot of power and it's gonna to toggle that light state.
So when they press this button, we want to toggle the light and we're toggling light state. But right now there's nothing letting the operator know that's happening. It, it would be happening right now, but there's no visual feedback. So we want to give them a visual and this can be found under the image elements. And in our case, a binary image variable is perfect. We are using a bit, the light state. It is either a zero or a one. That is a binary element. It's one or the other. If we had, say, a number of images, maybe 20 different parts, uh, we could have a list of images and reference them by number, you know, parts one, zero through 19. In this case, we're just going to add a binary image variable. We'll make this nice and large. And just like the button had properties, this image has properties as well. And it's going to ask us for the image source. So what do we want our images to look like? We can see that we can link a zero or an off state and a one, an on state. So if I browse in my off state, Unipix is a library of Unitronics provided images that comes right with the download. You can find it here at the top of the Windows Explorer. You can also feel free to use your own images. These are just some that we provide. And in this case, let's go with a switch. And we are linking the off state right now. So I'll link this. You know what, let's actually, let's make this a light. Let's go back here. Let's go lights and lamps. Let's go with a gray for off. Oh, excuse me. Gray for off. And let's do a screen for on. So we have our off state and we have our on state. Now, what would be controlling this right now? Nothing would be controlling this right now. Right now, we just have an off and an on state, but nothing is driving this. So this goes back to that memory and the tag link. Anytime you see a red empty, this is going to be something that needs a tag before a download is allowed. If I were to try to download this or compile this, it would tell me that there is a tag missing here. So anytime you see a red empty, know that you are going to need to provide a tag there. In this case, this will be my light state. And any green tags are optional. So if I wanted to enable the ability to touch this button and have some action happen, then I would enable this tag, touch, enable, disable. In this case, I don't want this element to do anything itself. So I'm fine with this. And this is a simple toggle light. So we push this button. The button is going to set the toggle light. And in our function, if the toggle light goes high, we change the light state. So every time they push this button, it is going to toggle the light state. Now, just to show you how powerful these actions can be, I do just want to copy and paste what I just built. And I'm going to create a second version of this toggle light. And I'm going to create a new bit here. So currently, we're using light state. I'm going to say light state 2. And I will create this new tag. Alternatively, I could have created a new tag and typed in light state two. Both are totally fine. And here, I'm going to redefine the action. And instead of setting and resetting a bit that is controlled in the ladder, I am simply going to toggle my light state two. Whenever this is pressed, toggle this. Now, that might seem far more simple, and it is. It's just one action to toggle this light. Um, this is just one example to show that actions can perform complete um, tasks right through the HMI. 
Now, I will say that if you have more than one person programming or more than one person working on it, it is much easier to walk into a project and look at the ladder and look at comments and read the, the ladder diagram and understand what's happening versus looking at a screen and opening up actions and trying to uh, reverse engineer the process that was going on. So best practice, I would say, especially if more than one person's working on it, is to do a mix of actions and ladder, um, but try to document things pretty well while you go through it. So this is a very simple example of just toggling two lights. Now I want to show you a slightly more advanced example with creating a splash screen. So you can tell that I've put these elements on screen two. And like I mentioned earlier, this is not the main screen. So we are not going to see this screen unless something loads this screen. Now, loading a screen is also an action. And it can be an action tied to a button, but it can also be a project level action. So, so far we've talked about actions associated with an HMI element, but maybe you want some action to occur based on some condition, and it might not necessarily be a button or a user interface. So, I'm going to go to my actions. I'm going to add a new action. And again, I'm going to be creating a splash screen. So after my splash screen finishes being shown for maybe 10 seconds on screen, I then want to load the screen that has my lights on it. So my event trigger, I'm going to create a new event trigger by clicking on the pencil. And I'm going to call this event trigger load main. So I'm done with my startup screen, and now I want to load my main screen. I will actually rename my screen to, to be main for continuity. And in this action, my event trigger is this bit called load main. The action is load screen. And over here in the properties, you can see I can select the screen that I want to load when this action occurs. Now, something very key to keep in mind, these event triggers, these are bits, and the system wants to be able to reset the bit itself. So when we want to trigger this, we want to set the load main bit. And once we've set it, the system will load the main screen, and it will take care to reset this bit. That way, if we want to load it again, it's already reset, and we can simply set it again to perform this action. So now I will go to my function one. And this brings us into global memory. So, or excuse me, system memory. So, so far, we have been using the global memory. And as we create our bits, you can see that they are all listed here. So anything we've created in the project thus far is going to be listed here. You can search here as well as create tags here. All different kinds of tags that you can make. Now, in addition to the global memory down here, we also have system memory. If you're familiar at all with VisiLogic, this is very similar to your system bits and your system integers. You can see we have a number of different system structures. So again, I mentioned structures earlier. A structure is just a collection of different types of data. So for example, we have a frequency structure. So here is a bit that is going to be on for 50 milliseconds and off for 50 milliseconds. Here's a bit that's going to be on for 0.5 seconds, off for 0.5 seconds. So these are some handy tags. Uh, if, for example, you wanted to toggle this light every second, instead of linking the toggle light as the condition, I could link this frequency one second. And every one second, it will toggle that light. Just to show you how that frequency is used. Now, the tag that I'm interested in here is under the general. 
and it's the latter initial cycle. This bit is going to be on when the controller first powers on just for a single scan. So if there's any sort of configuration or setup that you need to do every time the controller powers on, this is the time to do it. And a splash screen is a perfect example of that. The only time we really care about the splash screen is when it first powers up. After we power up, we want to really never go back to that splash screen again until we power down and back up again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a statement with an invert contact which again is like saying, if this is not true, so if the thing that I link is not true, so if I link my, my uh, general ladder initial cycle, this is going to pass power after that first scan of the controller. So the controller goes through its initialization, and then the very next you know, millisecond, the very next scan of the program, uh, this is now going to be true. It's going to say, yep, you know, the ladder initial cycle is no longer on, so we're going to pass power to the right, and now we're going to use a timer. So I want to set an amount of time that this splash screen is going to be on, and I am going to use a T on timer. There are good descriptions of all the timers in the help file. I'd be happy to go over them in the question section. For now, I'm just going to cover the T on timer. Now, a T on timer, when it receives power, is going to begin counting down. As long as it continues to receive power while it's counting down, it is going to finish counting down, and then it will have a bit associated with it that's going to pass power. So. I'm going to create a new timer. I'm going to call this splash duration. And let's say it's 10 seconds. When the controller first powers up, we want to see the splash screen for 10 seconds, and then we want to go away from it. So just like that, I have my splash duration timer set for 10 seconds. And you can see the timers down here in the timer section. And timers themselves are a structure. Again, a structure is just a collection of different data types. So if I go into timer, you can see that we have a unsigned integer 32, meaning that it is a only positive value, which makes sense. It's a timer. We have no negative times. And we have some value here. This is our preset time. So this is the time we're going to be counting down from. Our current time is going to be where we are at during that countdown. And then finally, if our current time reaches uh, zero, if we count down the full 10 seconds, our output bit is then going to be on. And I'm going to take advantage of that output bit being on after the 10 seconds to initiate that screen load. So I'm going to say on the positive transition, so just in that first moment that the splash duration dot out completes. So keep in mind that these timer elements themselves are not going to block power to elements to the right. For example, if I put a direct coil here, this timer element is going to have no impact on this condition passing power to this. Power is going to flow straight through the timer, but the timer's output bit is what is going to change. And we always recommend doing this in a separate net. I would not suggest putting this in series with this. Give this its own net. So when that splash duration completes, we are then going to set a bit. And we already have that bit ready. And that's our load main bit. And again, that load main bit ties back to this action, our event trigger. Whenever this load main bit gets set, we are going to load the main screen. And keep in mind that this is a set coil. We want the system to be able to reset this after it completes. So now when the controller first powers up, we are going to see this screen. Now, I said we're making a splash screen. And this is a pretty uninteresting splash. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the properties of this screen, of the main screen, the one that powers on by default. 
and I'm going to go to the background color slash image. And I'm going to link an image. And I'm going to browse. Now we have our splash screen. This is simply a screenshot I took from the PowerPoint presentation. You can use any image you have on your computer. So after 10 seconds, we're going to jump from this screen to our main screen. So there's some simple toggle lights. Now I want to get into a bit more of an advanced topic here, and we are going to talk about user-defined function blocks. So right now this function is just being called. It is going to run the ladder in here. If I called another function, that function would then be executed from wherever it's called. These are simple functions. There's no parameters being fed into this function and no parameters coming out of the function. For example, if I use a math add block, if I want to add two numbers together, you can see that it looks for two numbers on the left-hand side and it spits out the result in the sum, the C tag. So this is a, a function block that we've created for you. And just like all these function blocks, you know, all the way down to even motion control, these things are going to take parameters in and give you parameters out. Now, let's say that you have a piece of ladder that you are going to be using over and over and over again. It's going to be, let's say that you're designing a tank. And for every tank that you set up, you're going to need to control the level. You're going to need to let the user change the set point, whole bunch of different things you can design the ladder to control the tank and the HMI elements to show the tank uh, one time and give them dynamic parameters in and out. And then anytime you need to set up a new tank, you just put a new tank custom control on screen, you add a new tank user-defined function block. Now for the sake of time, I'm gonna do a very simple UDFB. Instead of adding two numbers together, I will be adding three numbers together. Again, very simple, but I just want to show the concepts here. So I'm in my function two, which is currently not being called. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that I want to add two numbers together. So that's the first two sum. And then I want to add that sum to a third number and spit the result out. So this tag this tag and this tag are going to be the three functions or three values coming into this user defined function block. So you can see if I go down to this function two, and I'll actually rename this now, and I'll say sum of three. So if I go down to this ladder symbol, sum of three, you can see that there are function in, function out and local tags. So again, I have three numbers coming into this function, the three numbers that I want to add together. So if I go to function in, and then I add members, I'm going to be adding integers. Now, these different data types are sizes. So an int 8 is 8 bits. That's 2 to the 8th power for your total size. And then if it is an integer, that is that whole range is divided by two because you have positive and negative values. Uh, an unsigned integer, for example, u int 32, this would be two to the 32nd power, and that is your full range. Zero, two, two to the 32nd power, that's the full range of the numbers you can represent with that. In our case, let's let them do positive and negative, and we'll do in 32s. call this num1. Now, if I hit save, this uh, box is going to disappear, and I'd have to go back down and click add again to bring it back up. But if I click add, 
it is simply going to let me add another function in, say num2. I'm going to add, finally, a num3. So I have my three tags that I'm going to be using in this function block. And now I need one function out. <laughs> if I go to my function out and I add a function, here is my sum of three and 32. It's my only function out, so I'll hit save. And now I can use those tags inside of this call. So if I say my num1 plus my num2, now, once I have the sum of these three numbers, I don't really care about what the first two are equal to. It's something I need to know during the calculation, but it's not something I care about on the output side of the function. So this is an example of where we could use local memory. Local memory gets overwritten function call to function call. So it's only used almost like scratch pad space, uh, an intermediate calculation just while you're inside of this function. I'm going to do it just for explanation. Uh, in general, the, the, the Unistream has so much memory on it that you are not going to need to take advantage of local memory. Um, it's really only the truly massive projects that could benefit from this um, majorly. So it's fine to do. I just want to show that you can do it. So this is sum of two. We'll make this the same type in 32. So num1 plus num2 is our sum of two. And then we take our sum of two and we add our num3. And now we have num1 plus num2, sum of two, plus num3. And this is going to give us our sum of three. So this is a very simple example. But you can see now, if I go to my function one in bold, this is the only function that's running until I call the other functions and I drag and drop my sum of three, you can see that my function in parameter names, num1, num2, and num3, appear as I hover over these letters. And let's just say I hard coded one, two, and three. You can hard code numbers, or you can create tags to link numbers. This is just a simple demo, so I'm just going to link three numbers. And D, the result. We'll call this the result. Now, the really powerful thing with this is the reusability. So imagine if this UDFB was able to control, again, going back to that tank example, it's able to control the whole tank. Uh, you know, if the safety sensor is on and the set point is reached, you know, all these dynamic input tags, and then somebody requests a new tank in the system, you simply drag that tank UDFB down. And now you have a whole new set of tags that you can link with different numbers. And this really does cut down on development time. So anything that's truly repeatable in your process, um, it, it's beneficial to try to create that into a UDFB. Um, and then you have it moving forward. You can even take this UDFB and add it to the library. And then when you open up other projects and you're working in, you know, different in the, on different projects, you have this library down here where you can reference those UDFBs. So you can uh, even design something to go, you know, across multiple projects. So this is a UDFB, user defined function block. Now you very well might want an HMI element that is going to play nice with this. So a tank example or something like that is going to be much more thorough. You're gonna save a lot more time by designing it one time on the HMI than reusing it. Uh, in our case, this will be simple, but I think it's still very beneficial to see. So the UDFB equivalent on our HMI is a custom control. So if I add a new custom control, you can see this is like a small HMI screen almost, and you're going to have basically the same elements that you'd have to work with on your HMI. So for the add three, we are going to put three numeric boxes on screen. 
excuse me, four numeric boxes, three for the numbers that the user can enter, and then one to show the result. So if I put one numeric box on screen, I'll put another numeric box on screen. Third, these are the three numbers that I'll add together. And here's my result. Let's go to our text elements and we'll grab a fixed text. And I'm just going to give this a plus symbol. Just did a control C and a control V to copy and paste. And a control C and a control V. Again, change this to an equal. So this plus this plus this equals this. Now, just like the UDFB, if we go to our parameters for our custom control, writable parameters are the tags that they are going to be able to control that they're going to be able to click on click on and interact with. So we want three writable parameters. And those are int 32s. Number one. Number two. Number three. Also, just to show you real quick, if you do type in a tag that already exists when you're trying to create a tag, you'll see that it highlights red. You can see I already have number two. You just change that and now it's free. It's able to link. So those are the three numbers that we are going to be able to write to. And then we have one read only. This is going to be that final result. All right, now what I'm going to do, uh, pretty simple HMI here. Real quick, if I go up to this HMI custom control in the ribbon, and I select optimize size, this is going to shrink everything down till it just fits the edges in. And now I'm going to link these parameters. So these are my three writable parameters, which are that number one, number two, and number three. So here's my number one. Here is my number two. And here is my number three. And these are not read only. We want them to be able to enter values in here. So if we uncheck the read only, now they can click on and enter numbers into these fields. Now, I don't want to get too deep into the. I don't want to get too deep into all of the properties here, uh, but just note that there is a lot more feedback that you can get from these things. For example, when when they finish entering values, um, whether the value that they entered falls between a minimum and maximum. Uh, and whether you allow them to enter numbers in the first place. So maybe in one mode, you let them change the, the set point or the number, and then another mode, you don't. And then last but not least, we want to link our output value, our result, or sum, I believe it was. Let me just double check. Sum. And the sum is read only. We don't want them to be able to change the sum. They can change the numbers that they're adding. So we have a custom control, which I will rename add three. We have a UDFB, our sum of three. Now, the last thing to pull these three things together and make them truly um, 
repeatable and very easy to de deploy additional instances is to create a structure. So we've already mentioned structures, for example, timers. Timers have a preset integer value, a current integer value, and a bit. Again, a structure is just a collection of data types, a collection of data that you want. Oh, in our case, every single time that we use this ladder or this screen, we are going to want three numbers, the three numbers we're adding together, and we want the result, that, that finished value. So I'm gonna create a new structure. So I go to structs, and I go to the screen plus, summing three. And in the structure, we need those three integers. So an int 32, number one, number two, number three. And we also want a sum. Now, the powerful thing with this structure um, is that these tags are now a collection. So anytime we need a new set of those tags, we just create a new instance of that structure. Now, to show you how you do that, if we go to our global memory, global memory is what we have to work with. Global memory is what is going to be linkable to the different parts of the project. So you can see right now, we don't actually have those um, those numbers. We don't have that N1, N2, N3 that we just created. And that's because we haven't made an instance of our summing three struct. So if we go to our global memory and we add a new tag, that structure that we just created is now a memory type. So if I come down to type and I select summing three, And let's call this first, just to show you that we can do multiple of these. So we have first of type summing three, and maybe we have second of type summing three. So now I have these two structures, first and second, and each one of them has these tags associated with it. So if you build the UDFB, you build a custom control, and you build a um, structure that gives you the tags that you need for those elements, now it's very easy to rapidly add multiple instances of these. So if I wanted to add three, I go down to my custom controls, I select my add three. This blurred view is actually just due to the version of Unilogic that I'm working with. Um, this has been resolved in the latest release. This is just something uh, with the, the current version that I'm working with. When you download this, it will not be blurry like this. Um, it's just a display issue right now. So we have one instance of our structure here. And you can see that it is looking for those tags. And our structure has those tags. So we go to our first result. That's our sum. We go to our first number one, first number two, first number three, and this is done. This, this element is now taking these three numbers and the result and taking these tags and using them. And then in our ladder, where we are calling the sum of three, instead of using these hard-coded values, I am now going to use the first n1, first n2, first and three, and first result. Likewise, second and one, and two, and three. Now you can imagine if you put the time in for a more advanced piece of code, how much time this is going to save if it uh, you know, has everything included in it that you need to run. 
So it's that easy to add a second instance of this. Um, and likewise, on our main screen here, we would just grab another add three. And we would link it to the second result. And it's that easy. And this is one of the more advanced uh, uses of the ladder of custom controls and things like that, that I think is underutilized currently by programmers. It's one of those things that uh, has some upfront programming time to make sure that you understand the flow, make sure that you test it all out. Uh, but once you test it and get it working one time, it really does save time if it is something um, that's gonna be repeatable and that you're, you know, you're gonna keep going through. All right, we are just under an hour here. So I'm gonna take a moment here and I'm going to go through some of the toolboxes uh, for the screens and the ladder, after which point I will take some questions. So let's go to one of our functions first. So basic elements, the contacts, if this, the coils, then that. So your coils are your output. Now, really quick to show you how easy it is to bring everything in the software together. If we go to the hardware configuration, and I'm going to add some IO to my project. So if I go to my UniIO and COM, and let's say that I have, you know, eight, eight transistor in, uh, eight digital inputs in, eight transistor outputs. In the IO tab, you can see that structure that's created for the IO. And you can see that I have my inputs with an array of bits, zero through seven. So those are the eight input states and the eight output states. And you could give these descriptions. If I go into my inputs, maybe input zero is a low level sensor. And these aliases are going to be linkable. So earlier when we were talking about those red empty where you had to link a tag, uh, you could either link you know, UID 0808T underscore zero dot input zero, or you could search for low level sensor. So alias naming uh, is very useful um, for taking the physical things that the controller is going to be affecting and very intuitively knowing how to apply them in the code. Now, if we go to our function, just to bring the IO into this a little bit, let's say that we want to do a simple pass through. If an input is on, an output's going to go on. So direct contact, you know, while this statement is true, keep passing power. And we're going to link that to our input. So again, we could either search for the UID 0808T input, input zero, or I could simply search for my low level sensor. So now when that input is on, this element will be passing power to the right. And if we wanted to turn an output on, we could use a direct coil and we could link that UID outputs and maybe we want to turn on output three. So when the low level sensor's on, we turn on output three. This could be, for example, an alarm or a light. So, you know, this could be another feedback in the system to say, hey, the low level sensor's on, so, you know, bring attention to this. But it is very easy to use the different memory, whether it's from a UDFB, uh, from an HMI, physical IO, it's all memory and all of the memory is accessible across the whole program. So wherever you need to use something, you're gonna have access to it. So basic elements, contacts and coils, uh, storing. Storing is just taking the value from one place and storing it into a different place. So if I wanted to take the number in first.n1 and store it into first.n2, the store block would do that. For some people, this is more familiar to them as a move command. Uh, it's going to stay in the place where it came from as well as where it went. So if I store n1 into n2, 
n1 is still n1, and n2 now has n1's value. Compares are very powerful. Uh, so comparing is looking at a value, comparing it to some other value, and passing power accordingly. So, uh, you know, as long as the, for example, a less than or equal, as long as the water level in 16, as long as the water level is less than the high sensor, just create that as a, let's say, high level. Then maybe we operate, enable operation. So this is an example of a simple net saying, you know, if the water level is less than or equal to the high level uh, value, whatever is allowed for the high level value, and you could change this either with a power up value, uh, saying, you know, the high level is 10,000, or um, this could be a number on screen. You could link this on screen, let them choose what high level is, and you know when that water level is less than or equal to that high level, power is going to pass, and we're going to enable operation. So now you know in the later nets you can say if we have enabled operation, then you know the rest of your automated process. And then any time that the water level is uh, greater than the high level, this enable operation would go off because this is no longer true, and anything powered by this contact is also going to lose power. So you're just building if this, then that statements. You have your math functions, very powerful. Data tables we're going to get into in our next uh, session when we get into data logging. RTC is our time, so setting the time on the controller, things like that. But really, any function across the program is going to have some ladder element and some screen element tied to it for you to control it. So for example, if I wanted to be able to change that splash timer, I could go to timers, put a timer box on my screen, link this to my splash duration, make it not read only, and you know maybe the format hours minutes seconds hundreds of seconds if i'm doing a splash duration i know it's always just going to be in seconds you know i don't want it more than a minute so i'll just do seconds and hundreds of seconds it's not read only so they can change it so now if a user were to change this value here they would effectively be changing that splash duration So it's that simple to create interfaces to the, uh, the different parts of control. And with that, I am going to enable VNC so that we can take a quick look once we download. Make sure my IP address is set correctly right now. 26, perfect. All right, I'm talking. And while this downloads, I am going to start answering some questions. So I'm going to take a look over here. Let's go to our question. All right.
since Vision supports J1939, can we destruct? Can we construct a user-defined function block to send or receive J1939 messages? Um, so you certainly could. Uh, message Composer is really the the feature that's going to give you that kind of functionality. Uh, message Composer allows you to teach the controller different message structures. So you could tell it to look for a certain message structure and take the data that matches that incoming structure and you know take this number from this part of it and you know store it to this tag, things like that. So Message Composer is really designed for that. Um, could you do it through bringing the the message into like a buffer and you know parsing the buffer? In a UDFB, absolutely. The image library. Um, so yeah, I can touch back on that really quick. So to link images, the built-in image library is in the left-hand side of the Windows Explorer that comes up. So if I went over to our background color here, background image, actually let's go to a, a button. So this button, and we'll even change this image, the second light here. So I go to browse my buttons, I hit browse, and it is here. That is in the upper left under Unitronics, Unilogic, Unipix. And here you have the full folder to use whatever you'd like. And you can see here that we have one of those add threes adding these numbers, and we could have our other add three adding three completely different numbers. So very simple application of it, um, but still very powerful. And you can see that 10 second timer for the splash screen. Could change that to be shorter or longer if we wanted. And let's take this as an opportunity to look at online mode. The online mode is a very powerful uh, testing functionality of code. So if I hit F9, or if I go to um, So if I click F9 or I go to my PLC and then online, I enter online mode with the controller, which is going to show me both the power flow as well as the live values. So you can see that that ladder initial cycle went to zero. We counted down our splash duration and we hit zero, at which point the output bit goes on and we used just the positive transition of this one to set this bit. Now you'll notice that it is already reset and that is because again, the system actions, the actions here need to be set to happen and the system is going to reset them itself. And here we can see that toggle light toggling our light state. So if I bring up our screen here, 
and I press that toggle light, you can see right now I am holding it. And as soon as I let go, we pass power. Now our light state is a one. If I press this again, the light state is going to go to a zero. So every time we press this, we are toggling that light state. Now this toggle light is all through the HMI. So there's no ladder involved. It's just this bit toggles this light. So it's very easy to see how the changes that we're making uh, affect the ladder and vice versa. It's also possible to change values right from online mode. So right now I'm adding one to 10 to 13. I could click on the 10 here, make it a three, set that value. And you can see now that value is a three. So it's very useful for testing, uh, especially if you have a remote connection to the unit and you don't have access to the physical screen. Maybe you don't have a VNC uh, set up on the, on the controller. Uh, you can still see those values, test values, things like that. Now, one other quick thing I want to mention. Um, this ladder processes so quickly that there are going to be certain things that you're just not going to be able to see with the naked eye when you're in online mode. For example, the positive transition of something. If the positive transition of something is, you know, if that bit is reset in the same scan, that bit could be set and reset within, you know, hundreds of hundreds of hundredths of a second. So if you ever need to test something that you can't necessarily see, if it's passing power, the math incrementers are an amazing troubleshooting or debugging tool. So let's say that I want to test whether my light state is toggling. Let's say it was a more complicated example where it wasn't just a simple light I could look at. Maybe this was initiating a process and I want to make sure that that process is starting properly. Times light been toggled. And we'll see we power up with zero. So every time we push that toggle light, that positive transition, is going to send a single shot of power to this incrementer, which is going to increment this number by one. And then the light state will change. So if this was something that was happening faster than we could see, even in online mode, we could watch this number and we could see it increasing by one every time power was flowing through these two elements or between these two elements. So anytime you want to check if power is flowing somewhere that you're not able to check, just throw an incrementer in there, uh, run a test and see if that number increments. Can I make my own buttons in another software like Photoshop and export them? Absolutely. Um, so that image library, that UniPick image library where I picked those lights and lamps from, that is just our collection of images that we provided. Uh, we think it's a great starting point, at least. Uh, for the most part, people will build out their whole projects using it being said, you can absolutely bring in your own images and use them however you want. Um, exactly like you're saying, one of the most innovative kind of uses I saw of doing that, turning images into buttons like you're discussing, uh, is somebody took a photo of a massive grain silo uh, with controls and valves all over this uh, picture. And the picture itself was taken from like a drone a ways back. So you could see this whole big grain silo. Um, and instead of having buttons on the HMI, they actually just took pieces of that image and used those images as the button image and put it right on top of the image. So from the operator's point of view, it just looked like a picture of the grain silo. And as they clicked on the different valves and conveyor belts, uh, those things would, it would either drill into it and give them controls for it, or it would just open or close it right there. 
So you can absolutely use your own images or Photoshop your own images, uh, or even go you know, on Google and find a you know, non-licensed image, uh, like an image library, and you know, use those images or go out and purchase your own if you, if you have a particular set you like from somebody. What is the best way to count an amount of time, minutes, and make a register of that? Timer or timer with counter on RSC, I want to expend the least amount of memory as possible. Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways that you can approach uh, something like this. So if your you know, timer, th if the amount of time that you're trying to keep track of falls within a timer, like uh, you know, 99 hours or so, then you could just use a timer and you would use a TA timer, an accumulated timer, and basically say, you know, every time that you want to keep track of something running, you pass power to that TA timer, it's going to count down. And, you know, whenever you stop powering it, it'll stop counting down, you power it again, it'll keep counting down. So that would give you a sense of total time that's elapsed uh, using just a timer element. Now, if you want to keep track of an in you know, indeterminate amount of time. You don't know how many days, hours, weeks, months, years this is going to go, and you want to keep track of total of it. Really, the simplest thing that you can do is simply say every second increment a number, after 60 seconds increment minutes, after 60 minutes increment hours, after 24 hours increment uh, days. And with that kind of setup, it's very, it's pretty light on the memory and, and is able to keep track of however many days, minutes, hours. Um, by segregating those out into those different registers, uh, you're able to keep it going for basically as long as you want. Uh, and I actually have created that myself I don't know if I'll be able to find it really quickly here, but let's say that I import a function. I go to my UDFBs. I'm going to save where we're at in this project. And I had made this with an older version, so it's just asking to update the project. While this loads up, I'm just going to address the next question. Uh, the question says, clashing of repeated calling of function in program. Please explain. Uh, so unless it's a user-defined function block where you have different input parameters, and different output parameters, uh, where each time that function's called, it's going to run with different values associated with it. Um, you, you're only going to want to call a function a single time per scan, uh, because there's really no benefit in running the same code twice in the same scan, unless you are providing new values to it to compute different results from it. Um, so you're, you're generally just going to call it one time. For example, if I had a timer in a function and I called that function two times in the same scan, that timer is going to count twice as fast because two times that, tower, that, that timer receives power in the same scan. So uh, keep in mind that, that a single scan of the entire program is extremely quick. So there's really no need to call a function more than one time per, uh, per scan. 
Now, really quick, just to show uh, this function, this is a UDFB I had made uh, upon a customer's request for exactly this, a, a uh, you know second minute hour day timer. And this is what the UDFB looks like. It has a, a input parameter, which is a reset bit. So when this bit gets turned on, it's gonna reset the time. Otherwise, while the elapsed time is receiving power, while we are running, we go into our elapsed time and it simply says every second, increment my seconds. When my seconds are greater than or equal to 60, increment my minutes and reset my seconds. And it's the same idea, you know, once my minutes is equal to 60, reset my minutes, increment my hours. When my hours are greater than 24, increase days, reset my hours. And then simply when they push that reset bit, we reset those four values. So it's a very simple UDFB. And, you know, you could call this a whole bunch of different times. Uh, you know, let's say that we had other run conditions, you know, run two. And we have a whole new elapsed time. So I could link a whole new set of second minute hour days and a reset bit. And now I have two, you know, unique time keeping uh, UDFBs that can, that can keep track of, you know, however many days. And if I wanted to do weeks, months, years, it would be as simple as adding those things as well. Uh, the, the, in this case, the customer was just looking for up to days. Question is, can you only use LD in the software? Uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, what, what that is, so feel free to, to clarify in, in the question again. What does checkbox lock element do? The lock element checkbox um, allows to keep, keep something in its fixed place. Uh, it does kind of what you'd expect it to. Uh, like, let's say that I put down a bunch of buttons And I like where they're all at. You know, these are my, uh, you know, it's a menu that I like, and I'm going to put them all up here. If I just wanted to make it so that I couldn't change these by accident, um, I can check off the lock element, and you can see that little lock symbol on there. And now if I were to highlight some of these, that element will not move. It is locked in place. Um, so you can do that once you have something in place, especially when you start to, when you're lining things up really close. And, you know, you want to, you know, maybe just grab these two things, you know, you could lock that and just kind of highlight it and grab those two. Um, so it's got a lot of uses, but generally just uh, making the, the screen design easier. Will the presentation be sent? So uh, these, these webinars are recorded. And they are available through the same registration page. So the same page that you register for the webinars on, this uh, unitronicsplc.lpages.co slash locked in learning series webinars. Under the full schedule, you can see the recordings from last Tuesday, the vision recording from last Thursday, and here is the session that we are in right now. So these have the register links. Those register links will be replaced with the recording link so that you can download this after we complete. If you have any trouble getting it there, feel free to shoot it in an email uh, and we can send the link out to you as well. Can a custom control scroll? Um, so I don't understand the application of scrolling on a custom control. Custom control, really just think about custom control as making one of these elements that you build your screen out of. Um, I guess if you're asking, can you make a small window for the custom control and then scroll within that window, the answer would be no. Um, you, you make the custom control uh, with you know whatever size you need. Let's say I put something in the upper left. And put something down here in the lower right. Now that I'm taking up this whole thing, if I go to my screen and I use that, it's going to be that full, that full size. So there's no scrolling within it. And again, this this view right now is just due to the version of Unilogic I'm working on. Uh, it's an older version, so the the newer versions have that resolved.
What session will you cover the built-in alarms features? Um, not particularly slated for any of the sessions, um, but I can absolutely do a quick quick show of them. Uh, alarms, the very full featured alarm system. Uh, if you don't need lots of control with the alarms, uh, dead bands and all that kind of good stuff, you can kind of make your own alarms pretty simply uh, just by saying, you know, if this, uh, you know, condition happens, you know, on the positive transition, uh, you know, set some bit. Uh, you know, this this condition happens, set, you know, alarm one. This is if you just want something really simple and you want full control. Uh, this lets you you control how it's going to look on screen, all that kind of stuff. Now, if we go to alarms and we add a new alarm group, alarm group one, you can make alarms in here, go to the alarms, give them different conditions, either on off conditions, maybe when something is off, safety sensor so if the safety sensor is off and you can put an on delay and an off delay maybe it has to be on or off for a certain amount of time before uh, this will trigger and when it happens you are going to get the alarm banner on the screen the banner so through the alarms the banner properties are over here and just to show you We go to our alarms, the alarm banner. This is what the alarm banner looks like on the screen when an alarm occurs. You can minimize it to the button, uh, view the list of alarms, snooze the alarm, uh, and it gives you some feedback on the alarm. Here's the display. Uh, you can clear, acknowledge, acknowledge and clear, or close. Uh, clearing requires the condition to be resolved. So if the alarm is that a door is open, you're not going to be able to clear that while the door is still open. You can acknowledge it though. Um, if the door is now closed, you can acknowledge and clear it and it will do both of those actions at once. Now this is all logged as well. There's an alarm log that is kept. So you're able to keep track of who does what, when, uh, at what time, whether they cleared it, whether they acknowledged it, um, all that good stuff. And then also, just because I think it's another very useful topic that we didn't dive into, user access control. Um, you can create you know, users and passwords and different levels, operator, manager, admin, things like that. So once you add user access control to the project, you can see that we have some users, user one, user two, and we have groups. So group one all the way through group 16, the way, you know, right now is 16 different, you know, uh, groups that you can separate users out into. And maybe the operator has level one access and nothing else. Uh, and maybe, you know, the admin has, you know, all access. He has, you know, any of these elements linked as L9, L8, L7 elements he'll have access to. And once you enable UAC, uh, UAC is now available to these buttons. So if I click on this button or or any element really, any interactive element, uh, when I click on this button, you can see this user access field now. And we could say that you know only somebody with L9 is able to press and use this button. So right now So right now according to that, uh, you know, the admin is the only person who would be able to use that button. So if you wanted to be able to use that button, you would need to be a user in the admin group and you would enter your username and your password. And once you're logged in, then you would have access to that element. And we also give you the ability to say, what do the other people see? Um, so if you're not a level nine operator, uh, maybe it's invisible. Uh, maybe the touch is just disabled so that it looks like it's there, but it just doesn't do anything when you touch it. Uh, disabled with the disabled color. So this way it visually looks different to them. Uh, and then you can also display a pop-up. So you can have it pop up and say, you know, you don't have the right credentials would you like to log in uh, to try to use this this element
when you created the sum three instance, shouldn't the block in the function one So when I created the sum of three instance, shouldn't the block created in function one be referenced to this instance instead of the function itself? So in function one, which is the only function that is running uh, because it's bold, it's the main function, it's the only one that's going to run, uh, it will run these functions when we call them. So here we are calling the sum three. And then these parameters that we've linked are what are going to be fed into this. Now I could just link numbers, you know, one, two, three, or I could link other tags and sum the three. But the idea of using first dot n1 through n3 and second dot n1 through n3 is that if I wanted to do a third one, I would simply be, uh, you know, having another one of these sum threes. And instead of using this a tag, I would be creating a um, another one of those structures. So if I go on my global, I add a new structure of my summing three, and I say third. Now I have my third n1, third number two, third number three, and third result. I hope that answers that question. Let me know if that, uh, if that wasn't clear. How to create 64-bit long inputs sum. So there's no 64-bit numbers um, in Unilogic. You might be able to do some creative uh, restructuring or evaluation or display to do 64-bit. More realistically, if you need higher than uh, 9 billion, I believe. So if we go to a calculator and we say 2 raised to the 32nd power, that's a 32-bit integer. You're looking at about 4.3 billion. Um, so if your number is bigger than 4.3 billion, then you could use what's called a real. Reels are also referred to as floats. And a real effectively has no um, particular limits. The advantage with a real is that you can represent a much wider range of values. So you're not limited to 4.3 billion. You could show almost any number that you want, but the cost of being able to do that is that you're not able to show each and every number between those limits. So reals are an approximate to that value. Um, and if you had to do a quick little bit of research, if you search floating point or real um, format, or computation, it's actual math that's being done with the bits. So it's a mantissa, it's a significant, it's a number being multiplied by another number raised to an exponent. So that's the way that it's able to show such a big number. But if you wanted to show a very specific number, like 13.336352, you know, it might just not be able to show that number. It could get close, you know, within a few digits maybe, um, but you're not going to have that accurate number control. An integer is always going to be a whole number, but you can represent every single number along the way. We do not offer simulation uh, in, in any of our softwares. So uh, we do recommend reaching out to your local distributor. Uh, if you don't have a panel and you want to test with it first, see if they maybe have a demo or something like that that you could borrow. Um, we always recommend downloading to a panel. Difference between in32 and real. Uh, just discuss, just just went over that just now. Um, but you know, in32 is an integer. It's whole values only: zero, one, two, three, four. Um, and then you have 32 bits. So zero to or in32, given that it's positive and negative, it would be that um, 4.3 number 
divided by two because you have that positive and the negative range. So two to the 32nd power divided by two. So you have plus you know, 2.14 billion to about minus 2.14 billion if you're using an integer 32. If you're using a uint 32 where there's no negative side to it, it's just two to the 32nd power. Excuse me, two to the 32nd power, 4.3 billion. I want to make sure I understand correctly, a set coil will automatically be reset after its associated project level action is performed. That is correct. If you are setting a bit that is linked to a project level action in the actions here, the system will take care to reset it itself. That way you can set it almost as fast as you want and the system is going to reset it as soon as it finishes that action. Uh, it is only these actions they're going to self-reset. So if this wasn't a system action, if I was just setting a bit called load main, it's going to stay set until I do something to reset it uh, somewhere else in the program. Can I do a, a like screen that is only drawn once, but I can link to different struct variables? Absolutely, that's the custom control that we discussed. Uh, you could make the custom control the size of a screen if you wanted it to be the entire screen, uh, and then you'd be able to reuse that very quickly. Is message composer included in the software? It is absolutely included in the software. It's down here on the left under message composer, and this is where you would teach the controller different messages. You would go in and you would build out that message that's coming in from the other device. And as long as it matches, uh, you know, these tags that you link in the properties uh, will then, you know, be populated as that as that message comes in. Is it possible to create and load pop-up menu page within the HMI page? Uh, so two answers to this. Uh, yes, you can. So um, one is a simple pop-up. So on a button, for example, if you didn't just want to execute this toggle light, let's actually go to this one. So let's say instead of toggling the light, I'm going to remove this action. So it has no inherent action. And I'm going to go to message box. And I'm going to say, are you sure you want to toggle light state? And we can give them, maybe it's a warning. Maybe this is a serious thing. And we can say, you know, okay, cancel, yes, no. Let's say, um, let's say, okay, cancel. And here we can give those actions. So if they say, okay, now we toggle light state two. And if they hit cancel, then the action will not go through. So that's one way of creating a pop up. Now that's just for that one thing. Now, if you say created a custom control, like let's just pretend for a moment that this custom control was a menu, um, or even that you just had a menu, you know, already made. You can take that whole menu, so you could, in this case, it's just one big block of elements, but let's say that it was these, you know, four elements that were making up your menu. They each have a tag visibility bit. And if you hover over this, you can see that a zero hides it and a one shows it. So if this were my menu, I could create a tag visibility bit called show menu. So when this bit is on, I will show the menu visibility. So a one is a show. Uh, and then in the latter, you can basically say, you know, maybe it's a button that brings up the menu or if they pick a particular option. So you could say, you know, when they click on this toggle light, you know, maybe the action is that it sets the show menu bit. And now when they push this button, 
this is now going to appear, excuse me, this is now going to appear on screen because it says show menu. And this could be you know, on top of everything else. So this could be like this, uh, you know, when you're developing, when you download it, you're not going to see it because it's hidden. And then when you show the menu, it is effectively going to pop up uh, on top of what you're working with. This type of training is available on YouTube. Uh, we have a whole bunch of YouTube videos. Um, if you go to our web page, either Unitronics PLC or to our YouTube channel, you can go to technical support, videos and tutorials. And you can see under Unilogic, we have it uh, segregated out into these three overall sections. But there's a lot, there are a lot of videos that cover a whole lot of different topics. What if I want to restrict numbers to be added, say 10 to 100? So I think you're referring to, let's use the sum of three example that we had. So if I go to my custom control and I go to this, now this just happens to be uh, because I'm going through a custom control, this minimum and maximum value that's allowed is going to be available on just a number box as well. Um, so if I put a number box on screen and I wanted them to only be able to enter 10 to 100, I could either say, you know, minimum value 10, maximum value 100. Alternatively, I could link min and max values. Uh, so maybe, you know, what this is applying to, like the tank size, maybe the minimum value and the maximum value of the tank are going to change from every tank. So we could say, you know, min and max. And now I have some values that I can, you know, change during operation. I don't have to download a change to, to make a change to these tags. I just have to link the tags on screen or something like that. But right now, this would effectively only allow 10 to 100 to be entered in this number box. When you click on the number box to browse, to, uh, to write into it, across the top, it's going to say 10 to 100. And if you enter a number outside of that range, it's simply going to not take the number and it's going to stay at whatever it was. How would I schedule an output to run for a certain amount of time once a month? Great question. So uh, we have schedules built into the code. Schedules are a type, a, a structure. So if I put a schedule block down and I create a schedule, maybe this is a a uh, light schedule when we want to turn the light on. So if I go to my global and I go to my light schedule and I browse in here, you'll see that we have from years and two years, bits for each of the months, bits for each day of the month, and bits for day of the week, and then a from hour and a two hour. So this schedule block is going to pass power to the right, depending on which ones of those bits are set. And it is only going to take the bits that you set. So if you don't provide a from year and a two year, it's going to assume that you just want to run it all the years. Uh, if you don't provide a month, it's going to run every month. But if you say the first day of the month, or maybe the 30th day of the month, then it is just going to be on that day. So every additional piece of data you specify kind of hones in on, on when the schedule is going to run. 
So if, for example, you wanted to, you know, every month, maybe on the 29th of every month, say one. So our on the 29th, we give that value a one. Now that's just manually editing the schedule. I'm just saying, you know, on that day of every month, I'm going to pass power for that whole day. Um, now we have screen elements that go along with this. So if I add a new screen, I have a schedule, a digital schedule for the from hour and the two hour. So if you wanted to give finite control over the from hour and two hour, you could let them change those here. And then you also have a calendar date. And you can link that, um, you know, right up to the uh, right up to the schedule. So it's very easy to give the user control of when it runs. And if you just wanted to do something a single time, uh, just use the positive transition. So, for example, right now we had that 28th day of the month as set. So on the 28th day of the month, this is going to pass power. So we could put a coil here and say, you know, 29th day. This is going to be on for the uh, this is going to be on for the full 29th day. But if you just want to do something just one single time, you could just say, you know, on the positive transition of day 29. Uh, you know, send an email, uh, you know, grab a file, you know, do whatever you need to do. But if you wanted to, say, run an output for the whole day, you could simply link this to the, uh, the output that you want to turn on. Say output to. So now this is going to run for the 29th day of the month for the whole day. And if you wanted to have it just run for an hour or just run two hours, you would set that from hour and the two hour. And this element would only get power during those times. Um, future project coming up where you're weighing and printing onto containers and the type the printer used needs a specific string. Can the message composer be used to add commands and values to the printer. Absolutely. So if the printer has a, it's expecting a set format, you would build out that format here. And then let's say that only the number in the print is going to change. Whatever we link this to, say num to print. And anytime you see that red squiggle underlining, it means there's no tag for this yet, and you can simply click the pencil to create it. And so now if something in the code were to change the number to print, and then you trigger this message to be sent out to that printer, it's going to save you all that work of building you know, the rest of the message structure, and it's just going to be sending that changing number. So you can build the message one time, uh, and then you know update the, the values in it dynamically. While online, can you see the details of an instance of a UDFB call? That is a fantastic question, and it is something that we have added in some of the later releases. If you're working on a much older version, you wouldn't be able to do this. Um, but we have this ability in this sum of three. This is that user-defined function block that we created. When we are in online mode, uh, I'm not going to be able to go online right now just because I've made a number of changes to the project uh, and I, I don't want to take the time to download. But if we were online right now and this UDFB was called inside of this main function, you can right click on the function and there is a monitor option. And it is going to drill into that UDFB and show you the current live values. Uh, you'll be able to monitor one UDFB at a time. Um, 
inherently you can only monitor one at a time because again if we take a look at this example or that sum of two that we don't care about that local value um, you might care about it when you're trying to troubleshoot that UDFB. So when you're monitoring one UDFB, you need this local tag to actually still be the current value you know, for that UDFB call. However, when we call that UDFB again down here, you know, that local tag is getting overwritten. So when you monitor, it kind of holds that local memory so that you can see it during your testing. Um, but once you leave and you go and monitor another UDFB, you're gonna see that UDFB set of memory. Does the PLC stop when you download a new program? Yes, you are going to, uh, there's gonna be some pause when the, when the controller downloads and, and reboots. I see it as possible to stuff multiple rungs inside the same ladder's number. What are the pros and cons? So you can absolutely build out very complicated um, statements uh, using parallel and and or things. So let's say that you know we enable, say we're enabling operation, and there's no uh, say safety error. And we are, you know, in position. Maybe that's a, a digital input coming into the controller. Then we, uh, you know, enable some output uh, UID. And, you know, this starts our process. So this is, you know, one rung, one net. Now you can absolutely build a, another thing related to this. So if we're enabling operation, but we are in, say, test mode, where we don't care about safety conditions. Maybe we just say that the, um, we say override. Maybe we have some override condition. So this is saying, you know, if we enable operation and there's no safety error and we're in position, we turn on the output or if we enable operation and the override is enabled. You know, we don't care about these. Either of these could be, uh, you know, true and it's gonna pass power to that output. Now, I believe what your question is getting at is that it does let you um, put unconnected elements. So if I just, you know, did this, this is okay software, I like you can do this if, two things are not connected to each other. Um, so if this isn't somehow connected back to these lines and, and affecting the rest of the flow, then these two elements should be in their own net. Uh, if elements aren't connected, if you have two totally separate statements that don't have some connection between the two, uh, definitely best programming practice to separate those out into two separate nets. how to create data blocks slash custom memory. Um, so the custom memory was back to that structure. So my structure was just those three numbers. But if I were to add a new structure and maybe it's a tank structure where I'm going to have a name for the tank, a string, tank name, max length 20. And maybe for each tank we have a um, I, level, a low level, you have a bit or a low level switch, a high level switch. So this is how you would create custom blocks of memory. So now we have the structure called tank. And any time that I create an instance of this tank, I'm going to get a new tank name tag, high level, low level, low level switch, high level switch. Um, so whatever you need to make repeatedly, you can put that in a struct and then create it whenever you need it.
I see a okay, let's see. adding more content that can then can fit on the screen. Uh, this is where the screen loads come into play. Um, so in the case of the screen load we did, it was based on a splash screen. So we said, you know, after 10 seconds, load the main display. Uh, but you could absolutely, let's say that we are on the main display and now we want to load our screen too. Uh, I could just put a button on this display somewhere. Say, maybe next screen, whatever you'd like for the name. And under the actions is where you can define a screen jump. So if I go to the actions for this button, it's not just setting and resetting bits. We can also go down, we could set a language, we could load the last screen, load a connection, uh, the alarm summary, all that good stuff. In this case, we're gonna load a screen and that'll be screen two. Now when they push this button, It'll load screen two. I'm actually going to copy that button. And now that we're on screen two, maybe this button's action is going to load the main uh, screen one. So now we have some, some next and uh, previous control. But this could also be, uh, like somebody mentioned earlier, like a menu. Uh, you know, your your main screen could have a menu full of options, and when they pick an option, it loads that screen. And then when they're done with that screen, you know, they click menu in the bottom left, and it brings you back to the menu display. And actually, let's move this load. Not screen one, I want main. Within the list, if the list is longer, will it scroll? Um, if you're referring to the list box, this is going to be relative size to how many options you give it. Um, so if I give it a whole bunch of options, you are going to want to make this fit. You know, it might scroll. Uh, I'd have to download and just do a double check. It's been a little while since I worked with that, but I'm not getting any kind of error right now with this. So it might have a little scroll there. To be safe, I would say, uh, you know, have the whole thing displayed, uh, but something worth testing. Undo actions, uh, very limited undo actions. Uh, undo is, is a pretty tricky thing to, to implement properly, especially when you know creating a structure or deleting a structure has such ripple effects across the program. Web server, real quick, absolutely. So let's say that we uh, you know want our main display available on the web. I can right-click the main display, say export screen to web server. Yes, there are screen size and web page differences, so everything is not necessarily going to convert you know perfectly clean. But you can see it takes all my elements, moves it onto this main display. So now if I were to download this project and enter the IP address of this controller in a web browser, it would bring up this display. Uh, it does not have to come from one of these screens. Uh, you know, we could take this whole web server and, you know, give it a totally different interface, uh, you know, using buttons, lists, elements. And this really is a totally different portal into the controller. Uh, so the operator could be, you know, on this main screen, uh, or, you know, or on one of these screens performing some task, and somebody else could be checking values to the web server, uh, or even changing the system to the web server. So it is it is uh, important to keep track of, you know, what controls you're giving to who. How about overlap windows as an error page, you want to overlap the actual screen. Um, so similar to hiding this custom control, your error page that you're referencing, 
could, could be this, and you could have it hidden and make it pop up when you want to by, by using that visibility bit. Can a custom control pop up? Absolutely, same idea. Can we create a function block for sequence programming? You can create the UDFB to do really anything you want. So it, as creative as you want to get with the UDFB. Are there confirmation functions on buttons? Yep, that's what I brought up a moment ago. We, instead of just linking an action directly to the button, uh, you use the message box, and the message box allows you to have OK, cancel, yes, no, uh, things like that. Well, the fun well, the program is running a UDFB, the main function stops or it keeps running. So the, the program works in a scan. So it is only ever processing like one part at a time. It's happening so fast that it kind of is going to feel like everything is being processed simultaneously. But if you break it down to step by step, it is going to check this and then it is going to start doing this and then you know it knows that timer is running it's going to go to the next net so it is just going to process these element by element so when you call a udfb or if you just call any other function um, it is like taking whatever is in this function these two things like let's say if i just like copy these now this is a little bit different because it's a UDFB, but to just give the idea of function calls, uh, if I were to call this sum of three here, it would be no different than me, uh, you know, putting those two ad blocks there and linking values to them. The UDFB just makes it dynamic and repeatable very quickly. Um, but when you call a function, it's basically just like taking the code that is in that function and sticking it in that net, sticking it to run there. Uh, after it finishes this call, it's then going to enter this and it's going to run through that and then it's going to continue down. Is there a simple function to round up or down values? Uh, that would be the math modulus function. So the math mod uh, basically divides and gives you the remainder. Um, so if you wanted the remainder, if you didn't care about that extra detail, you could uh, ignore the mod and just divide. So if you had the number um, you know, 101, and you wanted to, or 101 with a decimal place on screen. So it's being shown as 10.1 uh, and you want to round down, you could just divide that number by 10. It's gonna be that one time and now you just have the number 10. You can also use a formula. Uh, the formulas I believe have rounding functionality as well. What is the way of adding, subtracting, and dividing with numbers with a decimal place? Uh, that is real. So math with real functions are the only registers that are actually going to have decimal places in them. But again, you're giving up accuracy for uh, total size. So instead of doing an integer add, you would be doing a real. Uh, now it's very key to keep in mind that reals are only gonna play nicely with other reals. So if you're using an integer, you would have to either do an int to real or real to int. Uh, real to integer is going to give you, it's going to take the real and it's going to give you the integer part and the decimal part in two different tags. And likewise, the, the uh, int to real is going to look for a whole portion of the number, a decimal portion of the number, and store that into a real tag as one value.
can you record or log which users have accessed a web page? Um, so you can enable the UAC controls on the web page and require them to log in. And you can absolutely log events of the UAC. Um, so there are tags in the UAC struct that let you know when a user logs in or a user logs out. Um, so you could certainly keep track of that. Can we enter manually enter the hex value of a color instead of picking from the palette? Absolutely. So if we go to a screen and let's say that we go here and let's say that we want to set a buttons color. So if we go to the background fill, so right here, uh, you can either pick from the standard list of colors. Excuse me. Alternatively, you'll notice the old color and new color values. You can actually type in and that will get you that hex color. So you can do that as well. And you can also, if you are going to do that going forward, um, go to our themes, go to the HMI and then themes, you could actually create, uh, let's say that, you know, all those buttons are always going to have um, that background fill color. Uh, you are able to create a new theme and basically give different power up values to that. Um, so let's say we have a new theme. We'll add a new theme. Okay. We go to our button, button. And let's say that say that's the color that we want for all of our buttons. We can either set it as active here or we can set it as active in our project itself. But once this is active, now when I draw a new button, it is automatically going to go to that color. So if you find a, a color scheme or setup that you like or that matches your company's colors, uh, you can design that in the themes. And then going forward, all those elements as you drag and drop them will have those properties out of the gate. That way you don't have to you know, customize or copy paste all those different things. Since the memory is dynamically allocated, uh, yes, if the, the memory is dynamically allocated, so it is up to you to use what you want and you know the memory that you're not using, uh, you know, you're losing it. You're not, you're not really using it for anything in your project, so it's effectively just sitting there ready to use, but uh, you know, you're not utilizing it yet. It's just, uh, it's ready to be used for whatever you need it for. How can I find the error in the program? Perfect. So yeah, I um, there are going to be a number of errors in this program right now just because there have been a, a bunch of elements that I've just dropped down and not fully populated. So if I do a compile or if I were downloading to a controller, it is automatically going to do a compile. And it's going to let it's going to let us know that it found some errors. Errors were found. It's automatically going to bring up that error list but you can go back to that error list down here. And you can see that by these red X's, these are the errors. And if I click on that line, it is going to jump me right to that box. And you can see that I have that red empty. So this is what it's complaining about on this one. If I go to this binary text in our message that I had created, you can see that that binary text is not linked to anything. So it gives you feedback on where to go uh, to you know, make the changes that you need to in the project. How do we know how much memory we've consumed and how much memory is left? Um, after you complete a compile in the output window here, it is going to let you know down near the bottom 
right now, uh, based on you know everything I have in this code, I'm using 0% of my memory. I'm using such a small portion of the memory, it's not even registering as 1%. Um, other than projects where people just made massive data tables or something that just ate a lot of memory inherently due to how they're using it, um, I haven't seen projects hit the memory limits on these controllers. So you can kind of think safely that you're going to have memory to do what you need to. Uh, and even if you ran out, for example, if you did have a really big data table that was, you know, 20,000 rows, uh, you can make it 5,000 rows. And every time it gets full, you know, save it to the SD card. So there's, there's ways to work around any memory limits you hit. Um, and as far as the code itself, it takes up very little memory. The dynamic color for buttons, yep, that I did cover that. So the themes, you can set it for everything that, that's being done in the project or individually on the buttons, you can type it into that new color hex value. And last question here about connecting to the web server from any other device in the world. Um, sure, so right now we have a web server enabled. So if somebody connects to the web server, this is what they're gonna see. Uh, you know, we can certainly add web pages and have actions with these buttons to jump you know between these web pages so once you're on the web page you have an interactive hmi um, how to connect to this if you're on the local network of the plc uh, you're just going to connect to the ip address you're going to connect directly to the ip address of the panel so i would put 192.168.0.126 in a in a web browser and it would bring up that web page and then i would have uh, interaction with it now if this was remote you'd be taking care uh, you'd be taking advantage of what's called port forwarding uh, it's a networking topic not unique to Unitronics. It's what any device that's going to be accessible from anywhere in the world is going to need to have set up on that local network. So if this, uh, you know, if this computer that I'm on right now, if this network was my remote location that I'm trying to connect to, I would find out what my external IP address is. And you can see what your IP address is right now. This is where I'm at in the world. That's who I'm paying my internet provider for. And that is the IP address that you would be targeting in your web browser. So at the remote, you know, when you are away from that location, you'd put in that external IP address in the web browser and it would go hit the router at that location. And the router would take that port forwarding entry and it would forward that traffic to this IP address. So there's a lot of material out there in port forwarding. We can also answer any questions. If you have any questions on that, just send an email or, or give us a call about that. Ah, I see, Josh. So uh, regarding the dynamic uh, color changing of buttons, uh, it's not possible to just choose what color the button's going to be mid-operation. Um, that being said, uh, I actually, in one of my programs recently, I did exactly that. When there was an alarm, I had the button as yellow. If it was a uh, serious alarm, I had it as red. Um, and it's pretty easy to do that just by hiding and showing buttons. So if I wanted you know, I'm going to copy this toggle light, I'll paste the toggle light. So now I have, you know, two of these on top of each other. And I could just give this one a yellow color and have it hidden. So the, the tag visibility, just make it invisible, you know, and basically say, if a warning happens, make it visible. And likewise, I could put a third one on top with red. And so with the multi-layer display, you can stack elements like this and kind of show and hide things however you need. Can we have our company logo on the HMI, not on the screen, but the outer body of the panel? Yep, we take custom uh, requests. I believe there's like a minimum order size and some fee associated with putting custom graphics on. Uh, if you email usa.sales uh, or reach out to your sales channel, they'll be able to help you out with that. 
Can we download the program partially? Uh, yeah, you can do a you know logic only um, or media only download if you're just updating some photos. Me personally, I'll always recommend doing a download all. Download all doesn't do any comparison. It doesn't care about what's on the controller. It's not trying to save time with changes. It's going to push the entire project every every single thing over. It's the most thorough download. So I always recommend doing a download all. All right, so it looks like that was all the questions. If I happen to miss you, or if you do have any other questions that come up, please shoot those in to support at unitronics.com or give us a call, 617-657-6596. And thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to join the session. I know I answered quite a lot of questions here at the end. I tried to keep the actual demonstration to within about 45 minutes, um, but I try to take all the time here to answer people's questions. So thank you for your patience and hanging out if you did. And please reach out if you need anything and stay safe, everybody. It's crazy out there. So hope everybody's safe. Hope everybody's family's safe and let's keep it that way. Have a good one, everybody.